don't use covering. Uh, if you're expecting a yada yada and um, you don't have to get it. What I do want to do though is speak to the top of the hand. An old Cherokee is teaching his grandson about life. And he says a fight is going on inside us. He said to the boy, it's a terrible fight, it's a fight between two walls. One is evil, his anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, ego and hate. The other is good, his joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, faith and love. That same fight is going inside you and inside every other person in the world. The grandson thought about it for a minute and then asked his grandfather, which wolf will win? Now, Nelson Mandela said, no one is born hating, no one is born hating another person because of the colour of their skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally from the human heart to its opposite. And there's a story about the poet Theseus, Charles Lamb. Now Charles Lamb lived in 18th century London and he had a long running conflict with another author. The two had never met, the conflict being carried out through gossiping about one another in letters and newspapers. When a friend offered to introduce him to his protagonist, Lamb hastily declined, saying, I want to go on hating him, and I can't do that to a man I know. The more we know someone, the more difficult it is to hate them, and the less we know them, the easier it is to hate them. Now, in my real world, uh, I study behavioural psychology, and I'm, a, I'm unabashed about that. Uh, I, anybody here heard of LRP? Anybody? Well, in big terms, it stands for neural linguistic programming, it's how we think, it's how we work. And there's a process within LP called modelling. It's one of the many tools we use. And modelling is used by a lot of sportsmen, it's used by businesses. The idea is, if you see somebody doing something excellently, and you copy them, then you'll be excellent. And all you can do then is improve upon that. So, when I was doing my research for this, I thought, what I'll do is I'm going to teach you today, very quickly, how to hate. I'm going to do a really good job, and let's talk about how to hate. And anybody that can't spot the deep irony of what I'm about to say will probably be losing the message in general. So the first thing to do if you want to hate people is look through your eyes only. Going back to Charles Lamb, he didn't want to meet the person. Don't actually meet the people you hate. Don't actually want to engage with the people you hate. Just look through your eyes, and yours is the only one. Just take a black and white way of thinking. Decide on the things that you dislike about people, and then decide that you're right and everybody else is wrong. It's easy. It requires very little thinking. Just take a stance, don't listen to anybody else, and stick to your guns. The next thing to do, if you want to hate really well, is whip up your emotions. Get really emotional about it. Be so passionate that you impose your feelings on everybody else about a situation. And this is great because when you're emotive, you don't actually have to think. Objective thinking can avoid any inconvenience about the fact that the other person might be right or they might have a point. Just get really emotional and then you can contradict anybody on emotion when you have your hate argument. But hey, let's have some rational evidence. So keep it simple. You don't want to cloud your issue with any false information or rational evidence, because as we know, anything at all which doesn't support your view as a hater is fake news. And there are four easy steps if you want to hate. Select a group, and then the particular behaviours which support your stance and why you should hate them. Then find two or three examples of individuals that actually fit what it is you prejudice is saying. 
and then use that as a stereotype for why it is you're right to hate that particular group. Because now you have the evidence to support your decision. Don't worry, it shouldn't take long because when we look at contradictory information and when you work on the fact that you don't have to think about it, it's just easy to just make things up and hate. And for that reason, the final, one of the final steps is avoid critical thinking. Now that's really easy. For anybody that knows about it, requires that you apply a blend of active questioning, you examine things from all sides, and you look at the real picture. Don't do that. You know, it, all it's just effort, that, isn't it? It's far easier to just go, I hate you, or I hate them, or I hate this. So avoid this hassle just by filling your mind with prejudice. <laughs> Maybe join a group that shares your views. You'll get ready-made slogans. You'll get encouragement. They'll be able to give you more selective evidence as to why you're right and everybody else in the world is wrong. You can go to demonstrations. They're good as well because when you're at a demonstration, everybody's chanting a hate message. It's easy to join in on it. And we know this because Hitler and Mussolini were absolutely fantastic at it. And finally, talk. Don't listen. Always be talking, always be pushing your view. Take as much time as possible to talk around people that disagree with you. Keep talking and keep talking. If they try to get a word in, shout. Because the louder you are, the more your, right, your voice is heard and the more right you become. Now I appreciate that these steps might be complicated, but trust me, if you get the hang of it, you'll be really, really good at hating. Obviously this is the complete list, you can amend it as you want to. And if you're a beginner, just accept you need to practice. Rest assured it's a lot easier the more you actually stop thinking for yourself. As the British philosopher said, Bertrand Russell, many people would sooner die than think. In fact they do. So the old Cherokee, he looked at his grandson, and he said, Grandson, which one will win? Quite simply, the wolf you feed. This is an opportunity for you to feed the wolf of love and feed the wolf of understanding today, to have debates with people, to actually listen rather than speak, to not give in to the one that shouts the loudest, and to actually put yourself in the perspective of other people's shoes in the issues that you might believe are absolutely fundamentally right. I hope it's an interesting day for you, I hope it's thought-provoking, and thank you very much for your time this morning. Now I'd like to introduce you to Roger Hurst, the Essex Police Fire and Crime Commissioner.
some bigger shoes that are just listed there. If you're, if you're doing something because you're driven by that level of hate, then the crime you are committing is actually worse in the law in this country than if you are doing it not for those reasons. And then that hatred, that bigotry, that prejudice is taken into account by the courts when they are passing sentence and looking at the crime which you have committed. It's really important that we work with, and I'm sure everybody here in this room is actually like mine. We're here to try and promote the wolf of love and joy and peace that Andrew was talking about. The question is how do we do that? And, it, and the voluntary groups that we have here do it by getting out and passing that message on. But it's really important that we all do it in every aspect of what we do. Each contact we have with a little member, even with someone we've never, never met before, will make a real difference to them feeling that they're part of a good society and that this evil of hate is simply misplaced and not something that we can tolerate here in Essex today. We as police, fire and, uh, and crime commission, but also as the police service and the fire rescue service, we work really hard to try and make sure that we are squeezing out hate and stopping people behaving in these sorts of ways. We work with, uh, with organisations like Victim Support. Uh, they're very good at listening to victims and hearing them and supporting them um, and helping them understand that if they do feel this sort of oppression, they can bring it forward and hopefully help them, help, 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 help make them feel better. Uh, and we need people to know that in this county, hate crime is taken seriously. There is no space for it to thrive. We also work with the councils, so we work with, with Andrews Council um, here in Battleford, we work with the councils across the county, we work with the county council and the unitaries in South and South Durham. Um, and we have what's called the Strategic Hate Crime Partnership, which is actually those, all those public agencies trying to get together and think about how we reduce hate crime across the county. <coughs> We think the ways to do that, firstly, are actually by understanding it, um, trying to understand what gets into people's minds. I think that was actually explained a lot of that here this morning, and how we can put that right. But I see that we have faith groups represented here uh, in the room as well today. The work they do, I think, is so important in helping people understand themselves and understand what motivates them and other people and put themselves in the shoes, in the, in the place of other people in our society and sympathise with them rather than hate them, hate them. We work very hard to prevent hate crime. Um, so we do that in, in part by promoting the early identification of problem areas. For that we need people to report, we need the support of victim support, we need the support of, of third sector organisations, tenants where things are happening, because of course as police and indeed as fire rescue service, they're really good at supporting vulnerable people. We have lots of very well trained people that can get out there and support people if we know where they are and where they need that support. So really important then that we see an increase in the reporting of hate crime. I think we've done that in the last few years. Um, certainly the inspections that we, we undergo from Man Majesty's, His Majesty's Inspectorate tell us that the gap between what we identify and what is actually happening in the county seems to have, have narrowed. But doing that, we have hate crime ambassadors and hate crime reporting centres across the county, and they are out there trying to make sure that we are reaching out to people who could be victims, so we can understand, understand the size of the problem and get to grips with it. And that means, as I say, importantly, important these increasing access to support for the victims of hate crime, so they know where they can go. And the hate, hate incident reporting centres are really important in providing that. And then of course, ultimately, you need the operational response. Um, how are police in particular going to respond to hate crimes? And that means that we need to be sympathetic to the victims. When people come forward reporting this, they need to know that they've got a police officer who's on their side. 
who actually understands what's going on and is trained and experienced and can help them express their problem properly. Um, and we need to be able to accompany them through the whole criminal justice system. I was saying at the beginning that hate crime is looked at by the courts very severely. To do that, the police need to understand that it isn't a hate crime, build the file properly, and take it to court as a hate crime and have it properly prosecuted. Um, so yeah, that, that, is, that is an important element of the actual operational response to make sure we do this well. Essex Police do take it very seriously. Um, we have strategies for lots of different elements of crime across the county, but really importantly, we actually spell out hate crime in our crime prevention strategy. This is one of the things that is a really important strand in understanding how to stop crime happening in the first place. If we can deal with it, help people understand other people, and not, as Andrew was saying, indulge their blind prejudice, not listen, be convinced they're right, and exercise their selfish nature against other people. We can actually prevent crime. It's behind so much of what goes wrong in the county. And we also include very strong equality and diversity strategy. So this at least tries really hard uh, to be representative of the community as a whole. Certainly in our recruitment, we're reaching out to, to people I think, from every element of the communities that we have across Essex and trying to make sure that we, we have good representation. We can be, we, we, we as the police service can put ourselves in the shoes of the victims who come forward uh, and understand what it is that they're suffering. Um, the good news is that doing all of that actually seems to be working. Um, so in the last year, we've actually seen a 13% reduction in hit crime across the county. So I think particularly the hate crime reporting centres have been a really <coughs> valuable resource in getting people to come forward so we can understand this problem better. Um, and actually in the last six months, that decrease has picked up. It's actually down by 17% in the last, uh, last six months, which is quite a, a big step forward. Um, so we just need to, to, I mean, my appeal to you to here today really is please let's all keep on working together in that way and keep on reporting because the more we know about it, the, the better it is, the better equipped we are to deal with it. Um, so in terms of, of specific activities that the police are doing to try and deal with this, we have a thing called Operation Knowledge. Um, we always think of that, I think that's probably the best operation of I'm sure they're, 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 they're virtually always irrelevant to the, uh, the particular thing that we do. Police love an operation on that. Um, and that's a, a joint operation with the Crown Prosecution Service, who are the lawyers who take uh, cases to court uh, to improve the quality of hate crime investigations. And that means that we're putting together better files, we're taking more cases to the Crown Prosecution Service to then to consider, and hopefully getting more cases actually in front of magistrates. And that, that does appear to be, to be working. Um, so the increase in solved outcomes, that's the number of cases that were actually successfully taken to court uh, has risen to 11% and it was, it was around 8% and it's still continuing to rise, which is good news. Uh, we're also introducing channel, uh, challenge panels and those are panels that are intended to be for people who are part of the protected groups, trans, LGBT, racial minorities, people with different backgrounds and heritage, um, to support them, so give them an opportunity to work with the police so that they can actually challenge how the police deal with hate crime and give us better ideas about how we can actually support victims, how we can understand it better when we take it forward. Um, and uh, we really are committed as well to. to supporting that further and support Stop the Hate, which is an independent reporting service uh, which is intended to encourage better reporting across the county. That's a point that we part fun now as well. And we also try what we don't need through our joint education team. Hopefully you've had uh, a, 
quite a lot of joint education teams, joint police and fire in your school. I don't know, maybe you haven't, maybe you have. But if you haven't, we need to sort it out. Uh, <laughs> um, and they're trying really hard to make sure that we're reaching out to people, educating young people in particular about hate crime, about what we can do to prevent it, what we can do as individuals working, just being part of society and talking to the people who with whom we live and interact uh, and, and stop it happening. Uh, and making sure that we are helping people who are victims understand they can be involved in the support. Um, so if, it, if that hasn't happened, let's make sure that we make that happen. Uh, but this really, I very fundamentally believe that actually education and early intervention are very much the long-term solution to this. A lot of what the police can do needs to be done and needs to be done now to stop crime happening in our streets. But actually to reduce crime over time, it's, it's helping young people in particular understand how we can live our lives and not be involved in this stuff in the first place. And live a life where the good wolf is fed. I think it really, this goes very much to the core values of what we are, here in Battle and here in Essex, yeah. about tolerance, about support, about loving each other and making sure that we support each other through tricky times and not ending up in a confrontation, not ending, not ending up in arguments. If we do, actually how many people work through that as a group? Um, so that people are actually very much able to be who they are, be the best person they can be, and frankly, you know, live the life that they choose that we'd all like to choose for ourselves and for them. Um, thanks very much for listening to that. It's been a bit of a...
my mum uh, asked me to come back. Um, I used to say she shouted at me, I had to change my words because it didn't sound nice. But uh, I always listened to my mum and, and I didn't argue, I just went back to my house and was like enough to be picked up because there were many people who were younger than me finishing the state account. What happened was there was a congregator of Main Road. Um, my brother was hit by one soldier with five times in the head, he started bleeding, the soldier walks away. Another soldier comes up to him and says, Come with me. And he actually takes him to, uh, just nearby to wash the blood away from his head. Even the soldiers behaved differently. Um, my dad uh, ended up talking to one of the soldiers in Serbia, and my dad explained before the war here, we were keeping uh, guards uh, mixed. Uh, patrols during the night with civilians, just making sure no one comes into a neighborhood, no one does anything. Um, so when they started competing with the people, and my dad was next, he saw that never met my dad before, and he was a soldier of the enemy. He stepped in and he saved my dad from being beaten up. He wasn't the neighbors, uh, so the neighbors who came. He was, he was a soldier who never met him before that. Um, so even the wars, there are soldiers who behave like soldiers. There are obviously others that behave like animals. Um, they were taken to a local factory uh, that was, as I mentioned, it was everything was planned out to one year, no idea, but everything was organized and set up as it could be a frustration camp uh, factory. Um, my dad and brother ended up dead. Now, there were some guards who were allowed food to be brought in. As soon as we heard that, uh, my sister would go out of high school and a few neighbours uh, would just pick up any food that we had in the house, take it to them, and some of the guys would actually allow a brother to come to the uh, front gate and take the food in. But then there were other, other soldiers who would who threaten and go and say, this is not, this is not holiday camp. Um, one of my neighbours who was taken through to his five sons in the camp was killed on the way there on one occasion. Now, we grew up, I, I won't continue on that, but I just, I, I, well, I should have mentioned, uh, and considering everything that was already said and what was going to be said, um, we were good. We were all pretty much the same skin color. We were different religions, but not only that. But as, as children, we didn't think about it, we didn't notice that. You wouldn't notice it on the street, you wouldn't know. Um, and it never matters, in a sense, to us what it was. I, I remember at school, I wanted to play with a kid that played football with a kid that's Jewish, rather than a kid who's Muslim or this or that religion. Um, my most friends uh, in school were actually said, one of my best friends that I spent uh, uh, most of the time with, and we ended up going to uh, college together as well, was, was a Serb. They never played a part. And as I said, we looked at Serb, but when people want to create hate on the streets, they lose anything. And religion is quite close to heart for most people, and they knew that would work. And they propaganda that uh, worked hard to create that um, 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 ease between the communities in the first place and create mistrust um, was then used to create further hatred and um, talk about things like blaming on Muslim uh, doctors that they were injected serving women for years, uh, serving women couldn't have children, and straight to a doctor started disappearing. It was all in hope that people would ignore these doctors disappearing because they'd be thinking, oh, they must be bad people, so that's why they took them away. They continued, and then, as I said, it led to what it led to. And first concentration camp was called Keratin. Uh, my dad eventually was moved to a second concentration camp called Keratin. On the scar, my brother stayed behind. When I heard he was taken to Honest Registration Camp, which was a, a, a mine at, at the time, um, I thought that was it because we heard most people were taken to Honest School, taken because someone asked for them to be brought there to be taken there, and uh, he would be most likely uh, first abused and then killed. He did survive, he was dead in August. Um, in August 92, what happened was the group of British journalists, Ed Liani and Marshall, at, um, it was Ian Williams and I can't remember, there was a few others who, who actually got permission to go and film these demonstration camps. 
Now, the service that I try to, to sell it is in, these are not registration counties, these are counties where people can come to who can feel unsafe. Now, I knew my own brother and dad went, and certainly they did, uh, and all of my whole neighborhood. But, um, for whatever reason, the seven sides agreed for them to allow the British children to come and film. They did go in August, um, 5th of August, uh, I believe, 92. Uh, and you can still find this, this uh, uh, video report on, on YouTube. If you just type in Penny Marshall Illustration Camps Theatre, uh, it will come up. And they, by the time they went to, to film in Oscar, they did most people, including my dad, most people to manage the illustration camps, and my dad's third illustration camp. And they only left hands for people. So when the crew go there and you know, for this once to see the video, um, you'll see these people were dressed. And they were taken to continue to eat. Now that didn't happen, certainly not on regular uh, basis. Um, and they tried to say, you know, this, this, this is not only people here, we just keep these people safe, etc. Um, but that was the case. Uh, when the, the reporters went to, to not a demonstration camp where my brother was, and that was a different story, you couldn't find it, there's a lot more people. There's barbed wire around, soldiers walking around, and this was made from Europe. And, 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 and I, I say that always, always be aware of what I'm saying, but the reason I say in Europe is if after the Holocaust, the war said that again, and certainly what Europe experienced uh, being occupied most of it, um, you would think people were not allowed to happen in their neighborhood again. And if it does, if it's allowed in their neighborhood, how can we supply this happening elsewhere? In 93, continued, the war continued. Um, sorry, in December 92, um, my dad, following the video report, the war didn't stop. I actually didn't think it was going to stop. I was sure that, that the world would now say, okay, we can't find anymore. It's quite clear what's happening. There is yet a sign here that we've got a stretch camp in Europe again, we've got stuff there. What we did do, however, there was an agreement with the uh, Southern government to allow many prisoners to leave. And my, my dad was one of those people who leave manager concentration camp. They were sent to Croatia. The agreement was that they're not to come back to Bosnia, that they're taken to a third country. So they're not allowed to leave to stay in Croatia because they were afraid they would come back and fight uh, the Bosnian army in Bosnia. And they're not allowed to come back to Bosnia. So they had to be taken to a third country, and the countries had to agree to take those uh, people. In. Um, so my dad was chosen to come to the UK uh, and then we tried to uh, get the rest of us um, here as well. And that was 92. Rwanda was, happened in 94. So in the same period, the United Nations fell in two areas of the world. Um, and we couldn't believe it. I remember us watching what was happening in Rwanda. We couldn't believe it. So, happened to us, actually we should be believing that the world is not ready. The UN is corrected for a reason and no one wants to follow through. You have countries that are allowed to put veto on it. It's not about what's right, it's about what they feel uh, they want to do or not. Um, and um, the war continues for three years. Sarajevo was occupied uh, and in, in modern uh, war, uh, history, the longest siege of the city that is known and every single day it was bombarded. There was no a day's break, even during so many peace negotiations and peace agreements uh, for temporary ceasefire it never happened. The UN created um, six safe havens that didn't save a single one. And uh, towards the end of the war in 95 where the last UN safe haven in area to Renica and um, certain army eventually uh, decided to effectively come into Srebrenica even though it was supposed to be protected by the UN. And the UN stood aside. It's not even that uh, the Serbian army came in Turkey, it's the fact that UN gave belief to these people that they would be protected and stood aside, Serbian army came in, UN didn't put up a fight. There was no cause for um, airstrikes. And um, 
there are many, again, videos you can find and watch all this what everyone saw. Women and children being taken to one side, men, in many cases, uh, children as well being taken to another. Over 8,000 people have been, were killed just over the mess of days. Many were killed in mass graves that are still being dug up today. The new mass graves have been uh, discovered um, still. In Trieto, where I'm from, there are mass graves uh, all around the area. Again, new, new sites being discovered, but not only that. The way the peace agreement at the end of the war uh, was brought in, the uh, Serbia, even though the um, courts did not found Serbia directly because of the genocide, um, Serbia was one of the signatories as well as Croatia and their records where both countries work together to divide Bosnia. And the way you do that, you commit genocide against Muslims, Bosniaks, because once you remove Muslims, that's a big group uh, in Bosnia, you can do the divide between the two. Um, it didn't happen, but what it did do the world that gave us the international community, that gave us the peace agreement, has allowed the parties that run the frustration camp, the parties that did all the orchestrated killing, they're still in power today. In the middle of Europe, they are running the country and they still want to divide it. They still deny, they continue to deny genocide, which isn't surprising, considering the Holocaust is denied even today, still, um, after everything. So we, we're not that surprised, but what we are surprised is that our country uh, has a high representative who's supposed to look after everyone in the country, yet, as we made clear recently by certain uh, European officials in conversations to those nationalist leaders, there was one particular who from Hungary said, we will look after you because we share our Christian values. And that continues to tell me that Muslims are not welcome to Europe, sadly. Europe isn't ready for that. Um, and I believe people still can't understand that Muslims in Bosnia want to work together. Because after everything has happened, how, how can we? But we want to work together there because that's that's the way Bosnia is. Bosnia is this mix for for um, religious wise um, for many years. It exists in, 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 it existed in different forms over the centuries, over ten centuries old. Uh, we had a king who was Christian, but he was both Bosnian king. We're proud of that. Um, yet some people can't understand that, some people that doesn't make sense. To us it does. We grew up in a more uh, uh, Environment. And to us, that's, that's the way we, we only know to live. Um, how, how could we hate someone just because one or two more groups of people did something bad in part? Um, as I mentioned, I can't even hate, hate all the soldiers because I know some of the soldiers that helped my dad, that helped my, my brother. In fact, in the um, second concentration camp, almost which was the most notorious concentration camp in Bosnia, um, my dad was taken to this particular house where most of the killing took place. Go back to the way house. Um, I, I met a soldier once who worked for the ambulance service and he, he knew a friend of mine and he came to our house for coffee whilst we were still in the theater. And we, in a conversation I mentioned that I had a practice and well, after coffee he went away and then he comes back. He came up with a medication for me. He never met him before. We didn't need to do that, I didn't ask for that. Um, there were, were certain families bringing us food. Um, during the war, because we couldn't go uh, to the shops, it was, it was difficult. Um, even though I, I, was, I was still 16, I was, I was a child, I was tall, and, and people knew I was a Muslim, so it was, it was quite difficult for most of the time. Uh, but we had friends who were bringing the food. There was a certain family who didn't want to. Um, Go. One of our family friends who was the director of a factory, um, he didn't want to take up the arms, he didn't want to join the Serbian army, he was told not to come to work. So whilst we could think that uh, the soldier that said to my dad, perhaps maybe that if he had to, I believe that he did, because that's what was happening in those regimes, they were pressuring people, um, there, there were soldiers who were paid as well, but most of the biggest part of it was the army, the Serbian army, controlled by the Serbian government. 
And today we're still waiting for the apology, we're still waiting for the acceptance of genocide. And unfortunately it's not happening. Um, not long ago, the Serbian Prime Minister said it wasn't genocide, it was not all Muslims died, some survived. Um, I, I, I wouldn't want to ask what she thinks of, of Holocaust then, because if that's the definition. Um, in Prieto, for example, they didn't think it was genocide because not enough people were killed. Uh, so they call it uh, ethnic cleansing, as if that makes things better. So apparently ethnic cleansing is fine, but as long as you do and this all came with, with the group that looked the same, talked the same, went together to schools. So when you do look different, the, there is even more uh, that people can use to create that hate, and people do, but we can't allow them. If more people stood up in Peru, in Sarajevo, who were Serbs against them, their own leadership, we would have been talking, hopefully, we would have been talking about genocide. And this is why we need to, to step in when things start to, to, to be talked about, just words. Because eventually, if you don't do something about those words, it, get, it gets to something bigger, something worse. And it's much harder to start. At any war, it is much easier to start at the beginning. President was at the time asked the UN to come in before the war started, the UN didn't want to. It became much harder. When, when Syria conflict started developing, uh, the world started discussing whether Assad was war criminal or not. Someone was saying he's not, let's have a meeting about it. It doesn't matter whether he's war criminal or not. Stop the war, stop the killing. That's what's important. But we're not ready. The world's not ready. We're seeing the war again in Europe, European soil. Why? Because we weren't ready to act before we developed. We watched in 2014 as uh, one country invaded another. The world criticized a few words and continued as if nothing happened. We can't act as if nothing's happening in this hate around us. I had two little girls um, and I worry what's going to happen in 10, 15 years. I worry what's going to happen here, in this country. And I don't know what's going to happen in Europe, in Europe, in the rest of the world. Uh, in our country, the world could break up any minute because those people running away before, they still want the same thing. They haven't given up the idea and they know that, that, that um, Europe and the United Nations are not ready to do much about it. Um, and I worry about things happening here. I worry when um, people don't pay attention to the language they're using, uh, whether it's people with uh, general public in the streets uh, or whether it's politicians not realizing what those you know, few words that they might think they just like to use it. It creates, it creates an opening for those real haters. Um, gives them ammunition to, 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 to their propaganda. Uh, and we can't have that. Our leadership needs to be mindful of their own words and their own actions that they need to lead. We need to do everything we can in our communities, uh, whether we're talking about um, churches, mosques, Civicals, uh, anyone attending those places. You're the best to influence your community. One thing that I, I, I find difficult um, to, to deal with is that we're always expecting, say, Jewish person to raise issues of anti-Semitism or, or Muslim person to raise issues on. on, on um, while we're waiting for people from those groups, we should all be doing it. If we see something in our own community, in our own family, we need to talk about it. We need to talk about it in order to understand it. Um, most people don't want to talk about it. It's, it's a hard topic. Hate, genocide, it's not an easy topic, not for the morning, not for any time of the day, but it needs to be talked about. If you understand that, if you want to understand it, you need to learn about it, and if you learn about it, hopefully you can learn ways to prevent it and, and make the world better.
to be included in education. So from a young age, people are taught the value of respect and awareness in life. Anything which spreads awareness about it is a solution, as this is often done jokingly and unintentionally. Yet at this moment can develop into hatred and prejudice. Microaggressions are often subconscious and have many and many of them due to their own experiences and upbringing. So this is often an excuse for this behaviour, but it's not valid. It's our responsibility to realise what we say and do, and we should write as a We all have the right to have our own opinions, but we all also have the right to live freely and bear. As with most of those issues, it is possible to stop hatred and prejudice early with simple acts before it develops uncontrollably. Remember, if one simple comment can ruin someone's day, one simple comment can even gesture, or even gesture can brighten someone's day, it's up to you to make a break. The best thing to do is notice it, speak out about it, and work together to create customized solutions for your personal situation, far better than brushing on the carpet, which is often the case. Stop the start of spite. Ask yourself, what impact will this have on those around you before saying or doing something? And make sure it's possible. You need to educate yourself. Think before you speak. Don't make yourself offense. Check your body language. Be yourself reflective. Be respectful of others. Be tolerant and kind. And we're doing it for Colchester. 
and they don't even bear a bear risk for 72 hours when Roger Hurst took them to an event and I thrust the fleet bag in hand and said, go and put it somewhere which, you know, to train people on how to do it. And in the last couple of years, I've won a Pride of Britain Award, I've won a Knife Climb Award, I've won, um, oh, from Her Majesty the Queen, a Jubilee Award last year. And I should be really, really proud of those things. But the reason I got them is because my grandson, as I said, was brutally murdered. So that just destroys everything for me. So should I hate it? Should I be sad? So I'm glad that I got them for Liam because they're in Liam's memory. But I'm not glad that you know, I was ever put in that position to have this, this thing thrown at me. So I have, in the last 24 months, raised in the, uh, just over 30,000 pounds. We've all sort of walked around the room. I've got deep fits out, I've got bleed boxes, I've got bleed control bags, which are the catastrophic bleeds. I'm going to grab before I leave that one. So it could be a less bad victim, it could be a gunshot, it could be a mum's by accident, it could be a lot of people called over hurt and barricade sprains, a jacket who lived, you still find jackets at school? Yeah, a jacket at school, it could be a hundred, sorry, it could be a hundred, but it could be a hundred and one reasons for a catastrophic bleed. And in the last eight months, three of my bags have saved four people's lives that I know of. They're hopefully on anymore, but I presume there's something, something out there somewhere else in the last couple of years. Um, so I just sort of grab it on. So we go on to the next stage. Next slide, sorry. So I go absolutely anywhere, rain or shine, and I stand and talk to anyone. I'll go in church, groups, schools, youth clubs, absolutely anywhere, and just try and spread the word, you know, that. That sort of life that some people lead is not the right life. Definitely don't get involved in gangs. There are ways out if you need to, um, if you're unfortunate enough to get into it, but stay away from things like that. We all know right from wrong, we all know good from bad, we all know the difference, especially say, from love and hate. You know, so it's really, really sad. But if anybody wants me to go anywhere, I stand front and I'm more than happy to turn up. So our next slide has eight different slides and you can slowly flip through. And I will tell you where my story began. So on the 31st of January 2020, at 8 o'clock on Friday night, I was just going to go to bed. And my phone rang, I was pretty tired, and it was my daughter, my grandson's mum. And she was screaming, she was screaming, screaming, she was not screaming, he's dead, they killed him, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead. they killed him. And I, I thought she was drunk, I thought, what is she going on about? She's actually annoying me, I want to go to bed and tired. So I calmed her down and I said, what's happened? Liam's dead, he's been stabbed to death and he's in the pub down the road from you. So I said, well, he doesn't go there, you know, it's not public to go to at all. Well, he went there last week and tonight, you know, he's been killed. So I'm like, right, what have happened? So we got in the car, got the pajamas on, my phone or anything. My husband drove, and it's only about four or five minute drive from our house. And he was killed in Ridgewood. I don't know if any of you know Ridgewood, but it's quite a posh little affluent village. And as we hit the Humpback Bridge, I knew something was very wrong because Ridgewood was just flashed and blue. And we drove past the U another minute, and I'm thinking something's terrible here. There's so many police cars and ambulances. Everything's sectioned off, but in my car, I'm thinking it's not going to be my grandson, it's not him. So I went from officer to officer, from ambulance to ambulance, thinking, well, they're still here, so that's good. You know, he can't be dead because the ambulance would have rushed into hospital. I think he's in the ambulance, but nobody would let me speak to anybody. And it was really quite a traumatic sort of 40 minutes. And after about 40 minutes, and being in a pain in the I really was, a senior officer came out, and she asked who I was, and could I prove it? Because we don't know mobile phone numbers, it's on my phone, I can even tell my daughter's phone number. But she knew I was genuine and she just looked at me and she said, please go to your daughter's house, she moved <coughs> So on the drive over there, I found my two best friends who must have thought I was drunk because I said, Liam's dead, he's been killed, he's been stabbed at the Rose and Brown. Don't phone me back, if anyone tells you this is the truth, but don't phone me because I can't talk about it. And I really think, what did I do to their mental health that night? You know, I feel, I feel really bad about it. And I went to my daughter's and we were told he had a single stab wound. And we had a family there and all that And I'm not knocking her, but it wasn't right what she told us. She, um, the following day was actually she flew off to Australia or something. I, I don't know if she tried to help us. But I actually work or volunteer at Six Place now. 
because the rest of the police service were absolutely fantastic. I mean, she was as well, but for what reason she told me there was one single tab and we'll never know. So we um, had to wait the next day, which was a Saturday, and they came out and said, no, he's got six bad girls. That's bad enough, but we're, you know, we're, we're, we're just such a turmoil, I've always breathing, but we started. And the following day happened to be Mum's birthday, and they said, can you come and identify the body? And I said, oh my God, it's a birthday. And she wasn't going to come with us, but I said to her, you have to come, you have to come and see his body. And so I went into the, to the chapel of the mortuary, and he looked really beautiful, he looked at me, and the sound to see what I was thinking. He gets up and shouts, it's like, more I'm free because he's going to scare me. Um, and I went into the room and I identified his body. But as I walked around him, because it was quite surreal, nobody people warned me that he had more jobs. So his head looked like Frankenstein and it really, really upset me. And my daughter did come in, she ran straight out and literally the rest of my family came in. And I'm not lying when I say my then 19 year old son. He's six foot nine and weighs 19 stone, he collapsed on the floor. So I've got a body here, a son on the floor, the rest of the fire, and I'm thinking I've got to hold this together. And I didn't know what to do. But we got through that day. We then spent six weeks every day at the chapel of rest with my grandson lying in a coffin. And as mad as it sounds to you, it helped us. We didn't lose the men, men who were still there. We were still seeing him, we were still holding his hand, telling him we were loving him, and it just helped us get through that time, or helped me get through that time, should you say. Um, and then, unfortunately, the undertaker said, I'm so sorry, you just can't see him anymore. So we said, well, we won't come until the day before his funeral, which we call his special day, and that, that explains you why in a minute. So, Mum has only in the last couple of months accepted that her son is dead, and he's been murdered. Up until then, we used to have to joke that it was one holiday in Barbados and he was drinking pink gin. And this all makes sense to us as I sort of talk in a minute. We then spent 18 months because of COVID, which was fine because that got those killers um, put into on demand. It took the police 11 weeks to get them all because they run off, they got hit, they run away, people are hiding them. It was an absolute nightmare, but the police did we looked at us really, really proud. No complaints there. But I sat in court and I was told that my grandson had six stabbings two for his heart, two for his lower back, one for his 11th for the rib bone, lung, and liver, one for the right artery in his arm. And then they said, and 28 separate injuries in an attack took 13 seconds. Now he was very drunk. He'd gone out straight from work that night and he drank 140 mils of alcohol to 100 mils of blood. And I watched his murder, and I watched it many times with the police, who kindly sat me and allowed me, because nothing makes sense to me. Um, and I watched him sort of look as if he's a so drunk, he's looking and say, what's happening? You know, he's got four individuals that buy a stolen car with gloves, with bags, poles, big knives, in masks, just running across a very small Finnish car park, and the witnesses said, as soon as we heard the car, we knew something was terribly wrong with it. And that whole attack from start to finish took 39 seconds, 13 of those seconds were directed exactly on them. At the same time, his best friend was stabbed and mobilised in the leg, and the young girl tried to say, stop it, stop it, you know. She got stabbed in the hand, and she was then taken to the trial. So, it just went on and on. Um, so they do a prison sentence, but we do a life sentence. They, do, they, don't, they don't do a life sentence. So I took pictures, I think you might recognise somebody in there, um, a part of our murder investigation team. And as I said, I cannot praise them up enough. They, they went above and beyond and they have scored us absolutely amazingly. Now, one thing I'm going to say, I don't know if I should say here, but I know not everybody trusts the police. I don't know why, because believe me, they really, really are there to help and protect you and everything else. But if ever you couldn't speak to the police and you wanted to speak to 
crime stoppers. Crime stoppers cannot repeat anything you said by a law, and you have to phone them back. Because even if you get cut off, they will not know your phone number. So if there was something where you really couldn't speak to the police, then please find crime stoppers because we have to stop these things happening. You know, it's it's just not right what's happening now in our society, is it? And the next one. So this slide from my broken family. So as I said, my daughter, Lynn's mum, does not doesn't have accepted that Lynn is dead. So the, the, the adult there is my young, youngest daughter. And she's got three of her children. Lynn's little sister's dark head girl who's standing directly to her left. And the rest of them are her cousins. Now because of hate, we don't have grave. We have nowhere to go or anything like that. Because even from prison, they are hating the fact that they're in prison and threatening to smash things up. So Lynn is safely locked away somewhere that only I know of. And we have a tree that we go to, but they didn't start cutting the branches off the tree and things like that. Um, so it's just ridiculous. But this is what I call my broken family. So Lynn's mum is completely now alcohol dependent. And she hates. Hate isn't even the word for it, this has destroyed her life, that word. She cannot forgive, we cannot talk to her, we cannot say anything. She has PTSD and she has insomnia. She didn't come to court, to my knowledge, and I go anywhere and I've gone to newspapers and magazines and I've printed this story because I never want him to be forgotten. Um, to my knowledge, she doesn't know because she refuses to read anything of how he was killed, but she has reoccurring nightmares when she does sleep because she's imagining how she how he died. Now I think I don't know what she's worth not knowing or knowing and imagining what I don't know what she imagines. So in their house they have their light on 24 7 because they are petrified of the dog. They are scared that someone's gonna come and get them. His brother, who's not on there, you see that you'll meet Lewis in a little while. Um, he used to be quite a chubby little boy, you know, quite a lazy little thing, wants to sit on the Xbox and just eat and drink, you know, just stuff and just play the Xbox. He never has no possessed life at all. He's half his body weight and he just says, all right, all right, and that's all he says. But his little sister standing there, she's now 15. She goes three and a half stone. She doesn't want to ever leave her house. And she, like, she can stay in the bedroom all day. She's happy to stay there. She's had three days from school in the last five years. And in her own words, she is absolutely terrified of death. She, is, she sees fear in everything. Because her brother went to work, went out for a drink, and the worst crime he committed was he lied to his girlfriends and got his way home and went out his best man. And so she's absolutely terrified of death. So I'd like you now just to meet Lynn. But 
thank you for listening, and I hope none of you are too upset by this story. Now I'd like to welcome Karen Fuller from the Craig Tyler Trust. Thank you. Stephen Metcalf, the MP for South Macedon and East Thorough. Thank you. Uh, 
um, thank you very much. I'm going to assume I don't need the microphone. Yeah, good. Um, well, uh, firstly, I've got to say a few thank yous. Um, and the first big thank you really is to Bob, who sadly isn't here. Bob Sheridan, who has uh, worked for me for the last 13 years, um, runs special projects that he and I identify that we want to try and uh, conduct out in the community. And this is something that we have done over a good number of years. And this is not the first uh, Hope Not Hate, uh, Stop the Hate conference we've had. But sadly, Bob, as we heard earlier, is not very well. Uh, he's in hospital. He is uh, he's suffering. But he did do an awful lot of work to put this together today. Um, and I think he would be very proud of what he has seen today. So I just want you to uh, yeah, bear in uh, keeping your thoughts at Bob, and particularly also his two sisters, Debs and Annie, who took over the reins and made sure that today uh, actually happened. So thank you both. Um, we can also thank Barbara and Dean, uh, Logan and Liam and Curtis, who also stepped in at the last minute to, to help uh, make sure this happened. Well, we've heard a lot of contributions um, today. Uh, very varied, very interesting. We heard from Andy, uh, who told us that you can learn to hate, you do learn to hate, and I think it's also therefore true that you can learn not to hate. Uh, and so that, I think, is a, a key message. Sadly, what I'm involved with is often fueled by hate. Um, and I have to say, people often tell me how much they hate me. Uh, they do it on social or on social media. Uh, they've never met me. They just hate what I stand for. They hate the fact that I have some beliefs that are different to them. Uh, now, I get used to that, uh, sadly. I've got a rather thicker skin. But it hurts the people around me who don't see the same person uh, that they describe. And so what I would say from what Andy said was that um, you know, words have consequences. They don't necessarily have consequences always at the person they're aiming at. It can be other people as well. Roger uh, Hurst, our Police Fire and Crime Commissioner, uh, said that we need to be living examples of peace and hope and not hate, so that we can be out there demonstrating uh, that to all those that we meet and, and interact with. And he also thanked all the local organisations who are here and are doing that out in our uh, community. And then, of course, we heard from uh, Safed. Uh, and thank you so much for sharing and talking about uh, your experiences of the war in Bosnia and how it affected uh, you and your family. I think it struck home when you said it sounded like a movie, that you were living a movie, that it didn't seem like it was to you. It was just unbelievable. Um, but I think you also gave us a, a beacon of hope when you talked about the soldier, although on the enemy side, who had helped your father. Uh, and that reminds us to try and always give people the benefit of the doubt, to try and see good in people and not just judge them by the way they necessarily what they uh, are seen uh, to represent. Um, we talked about the concentration camps and how the world turned a blind eye and our failure to act as we've potentially failed to act in tackling uh, the problems that we're seeing now between Russia and Ukraine. Now I'm very fortunate, I've been to uh, Bosnia and I've actually been to Srebrenica. I've been to the graves there and you talked about the 8,000 who were killed, the mass graves. But it gets worse than that because those mass graves were dug up and moved around and moved around again and moved around again to try and cover up the genocide and, don't, and be in no doubt that it was a genocide that took place. Which means that whilst we know there are people who are missing, their remains have sadly never been uh, found. One of the most moving things you see if you go to the grave uh, is the gaps in there are very regimented rows of upright gravestones. But the gaps are where they know there was a family member missing, but remains have never been found. They may one day be good, they may one day be found. They're still searching the graves, they're still analysing using DNA testing 
to try and give the families who suffered uh, the closure that they looked for. Now, I was very fortunate when I was there, I met with families of the victims. And again, they were filled with sadness and regret rather than hate. Because they had recognized that the hate would do nothing to help them or the people who had been lost. And I think that was a very strong and important message. So thank you for reminding me of that experience and for sharing uh, your experience. Um, then we heard from Suzanne, who talked about the different types uh, of discrimination that exists and how that can turn from uh, in, into hate. You know, the, the grounds being race, religion, sexual orientation, sex and gender, disability and trans. All those things uh, can lead to uh, unpleasantness, which can lead to hatred, which can lead to discrimination. So thank you for sharing that uh, and sharing uh, the, what we can do about it as well. And, we can <coughs> and then of course we had a fantastic presentation from Woodlands. Thank you so much for that and for your contribution. Uh, it was absolutely uh, brilliant to show us what microaggression is, but also some of the solutions that can uh, be delivered. And I hope you found there a valuable experience making that presentation. And I hope you've shared it with the whole school. I hope, have you had an opportunity to share it with the school? You're, we're the first. Well, I would highly recommend sharing that with the whole school. I think it was a, a very powerful and strong message. So thank you. And then, of course, we have Jude. Jude, thank you for sharing your uh, tragic and sad story. I'm going to admit, I turned up to that day. But it must have been incredibly, well, incredibly hard. Firstly, to go through that experience, then to take something positive from it and come and share it with you. Because you have to read it, and you can't put it away. Uh, but you have turned it into something positive. So thank you for that, for sharing with us. And then finally, of course, to Karen. Thank you. Uh, again, both to you and to Julie. Please accept all our condolences for sharing your story about Ray. Uh, and for what you are doing to spread the hope uh, that exists. I visited with Ray. At Tyler Trust, it is a very positive organisation. Uh, it's trying to make a difference to, to people's lives. So thank you for that. Please, everyone, continue to do what you are doing. Um, and I think that's the message for today: is to uh, go away from here and share all the positive messages that have come out of this. Where something that was negative, something that was tragic, disaster, can be used to foster a better. Future. And I think that's the simple message, Jesus. Yes, the world is a tough place. Yes, our lives can be difficult. Yes, there are people who we will interact with, who won't share our values, who will not be kind, will not be nice. But don't use that to allow you to learn to hate. Use it as a way of going out of the world and trying to persuade them and other people to take a different path. And if we all play a small role in that, the world, in the long term, Hopefully, it will be a better place. Thank you again for all the contributions to all those who have made uh, today possible. And hopefully, we will have another one of at some point in the future to continue the work that we've been doing to foster the message to stop the hate. Thank you. Sorry, the minute I haven't got uh, my prompt on my shoulder, I forget to. Which is, of course, to thank Callum, who's been acting as our Thank you, Callum. I think you are going to formally close proceedings. I am very aware that as a young student, I cannot make a difference on my own, but I am committed to trying to inspire other young people I'm in touch with to think about stopping the hate that is destroying humanity. So please, let us try and build society free of hatred for the sake of us all. And please do not let us look back in anger, but forward with hope. Thank you.